we are starting this morning's webinar and on behalf of the Centre for Occupational and Environmental Health I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the topic non-animal occupational toxicology testing technology and policy. Before our speaker begins I'd like to review a few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation, so if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat. And at the completion of the presentation, the presenter will spend five to 10 minutes in Q&A. So again, you'll see a chat option or a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen and you can enter any questions there. CE credit is also available for registered nurses and, may be and this webinar may be eligible for industrial hygiene credits. If you wish to obtain credit, please register again at coehce.org and you must also complete the evaluation for the webinar, which you will be sent by email. After that, you will be emailed your certificate of completion. After today, the webinar will be archived and a link will be provided to all attendees and it will also be available on coehce.org for CE credit only. Please do complete the evaluation. We appreciate the feedback. So now I'd like our webinar to begin. And first of all, I'd like to ask Dr. James Craner, Occupational Health Physician and COEH Advisory Committee member to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Craner. Thank you. As an advisory board member for the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, and as an occupational and environmental medicine physician in practice for 24 years, an adjunct faculty member in the UCSF Division of Occupational Medicine, I am pleased to introduce the first COEH educational offering on the topic of non-animal occupational toxicology testing. This subject has substantial and often controversial ethical, economic, and technical implications to not only health and safety professionals, but also to the broader medical, scientific, legal, and regulatory communities. This introductory presentation is intended to spark further interest in discussion, research, education, and collaboration in the rapidly evolving technological and policy advances in replacing animal testing. Today, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Christy Sullivan, MPH, who is the Vice President for Research Policy at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, an organization which I have been an active member of since 1991. PCRM is the world's largest physician-based organization uh, dedicated, to advancing human, dedicated to advancing humane solutions to improving human health, scientific research, and medical school and residency education. PCRM's membership includes more than 12,000 physicians supported by the dedicated actions of 150,000 members across the United States and around the world. Ms. Sullivan obtained her, her Bachelor of Science in Biological Anthropology and Master of Public Health degree in Toxicology from the University of Michigan. She has devoted her professional career to advancing the science of non-animal toxicology testing. Prior to working with PCRM, Ms. Sullivan was an analyst at the University of Michigan Environmental Health and Safety Department and later with the New York City Department of Health's Environmental Laboratory. At PCRM, Ms. Sullivan's role is to promote the development and use of human relevant methods for testing, research, and training through collaboration with industry, academic, and government stakeholders on topics such as acute toxicity, skin and eye irritation, respiratory toxicity, and cancer risk. Her accomplishments have included numerous peer-reviewed publications, presentations, and chairing and organizing national and international conferences for workshops for industry and regulatory toxicologists on methods and policies, as well as consulting to companies in a variety of industries on implementing advanced testing methods into their toxicology programs. For example, she currently coordinates the International Council on Animal Protection and OECD, OECD programs, a coalition of non-governmental organizations advancing the replacement of in vivo guidelines uh, at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. She serves as Secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Comput Computational Toxicology and is an active member of the Society of Toxicology. Ms. Sullivan also serves on or consults to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's advisory committees that address animal toxicity testing related to policy development and enforcement of EPA regulations, 
such as the recent changes in the Toxic Substances Control Act that greatly expanded EPA's scope and regulatory purview from the environment into the workplace where certain chemicals are manufactured or handled. Finally, uh, on a personal note, in 2015, I collaborated with Christy and another UCSF OEM faculty member to author a critical review of cyanide antidotes that led to the, led to the development of an industry best practices program for on-site antidote administration that is now being implemented by one of the largest gold mining companies in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you, Dr. Craner, for that introduction. I would like to also thank the Berkeley Center for Occupational and Environmental Health for this uh, opportunity and to thank you for your attention today. So I will go ahead and jump right in. Uh, just to briefly declare no conflicts of financial interest, but obviously the Physicians Committee is a nonprofit organization which advocates for replacing animal tests um, in a variety of settings with more human relevant methods, as Dr. Craner mentioned. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about some of the drivers in place for replacing in vivo tests some of the progress in developing new methods and some of the methods that are available today. I will also talk a little bit about the future, something called adverse outcome pathways as a mechanism for capacity building for predictive toxicology and the regulatory use of these scientifically uh, developed methods and of course, hopefully provide you some resources. So historically, as most of you know, of course, uh, for several decades, chemicals have been assessed for toxicity to humans with in vivo tests with guinea pigs, rabbits, rats, mice, and dogs mostly. Um, the tests conducted depend on the regulatory sector. And this slide just shows the list of some of the most common endpoints investigated in some of those tests. Uh, for example, uh, pesticide sectors uh, often are required to provide a long checkbox list of uh, animal data, which then regulators pick through to try to determine the most relevant endpoints to set exposure values. Uh, contrasting with industrial chemicals, the same kinds of tests are used, but the requirements of what kinds of tests co to conduct and when can vary. One major disadvantage to this testing is ethical. Animals are given very high doses of chemicals, are not provided pain relief, and are subject to restraint and handling stress. Animals often die during the testing. Because tests are expensive and time consuming, we're simply not able to effectively assess chemicals for toxicity. And just as an example, one uh, study, the One Generation Reproductive Toxicity Study, takes more than 1,200 animals for a single chemical, it takes about 15 months to conduct, and is uh, several, many thousands of dollars. As we see, this manifests as a major gap in the number of chemicals which have been addressed versus those that are on the market today. And this is really compounded by the seemingly endless new issues that should be considered by regulatory toxicologists, but often aren't. And you can see sort of a list of some of the issues that have cropped up in the past couple of decades here. But one major problem is that we're exposed to mixtures of chemicals and environmental factors that uh, in this complicated reality is not really reflected in the in vivo testing paradigm that is used to assess chemicals. There are uh, also examples to show that animal test results do not always apply to humans, which sets the stage for delays and questions about how to move forward with regulatory action. And animal studies can be a black box. The endpoints of death or tumor incidents are not 
incredibly helpful when you're trying to determine irrelevance to humans and this uncertainty, um, better mechanistic understanding can resolve some of this uncertainty and help companies define safer controls or safer chemicals. Through the years, we have seen negative animal study results delay understanding of human risk. Thalidomide was eventually found to be teratogenic after several years of negative animal tests, but it's not clear we can detect developmental toxicants adequately today. There are also thousands of animal studies on bisphenol A, a and yet no one can seem to agree on the need for whether there is, whether there is the need for stricter regulation. And you also have the issue that false positive results from animal tests could bar beneficial products or medicines. For example, and aspirin is a very helpful pharmaceutical for humans, but is teratogenic in several animal species. So it would not uh, pass through the current set of, of regulatory requirements today. And clearly, um, very concerning is the idea that false negatives could cause harm. In fact, adverse drug reactions coming away from chemicals for a bit, adverse drug reactions are the fourth leading cause of death in uh, the United States. And the, the market failure or clinical failure rate for new medicines that have passed through animal toxicology tests is about 96%. Finally, you have pesticide epidemiology studies coming up to, that seem to potentially conflict with animal data. And so how do, we, uh, how do we interpret all of this? Considering all of this, efforts have been underway to modernize toxicology. The EPA commissioned the National Academies Committee on Toxicity Testing and Environmental Agents uh, to envision a start from scratch strategy of how we would be evaluating chemicals for their potential to cause harm. And how can we address some of the serious issues with our current approach? If we today had the technology available that we, did, that we didn't have in the past, the report really recognized that even then in 2007, there had been a massive revolution in biology and computing powder that should be, but was not being taken advantage of in toxicology. And so when the report was published, it concluded and envisioned a future in which virtually all routine toxicity testing would be conducted in vitro in human cells or cell lines by evaluating something called perturbations of cellular response. This table from the report shows the advantages of a range of different solutions or paradigms that they considered. And before 2007, we were really sort of in this in-between uh, where most toxicology was in uh, high-dose animal studies based on apical endpoints. And that there was sort of some tiered testing taking place, some use of prediction with uh, quantitative structure activity relationship tools and other computational tools. And I would say now uh, we've kind of moved more towards using uh, tiered testing and QSARs. We have had some in vitro methods replace in vivo tests. And we are starting to see some uh, cellular response perturbations uh, be used to make regulatory decisions. Eventually, the committee recommended a paradigm in which uh, testing was primarily based on human biology and on these perturbations of cellular responses. And this idea is based on a concept of biological pathways. So normal biologic function at some point is perturbed by exposure to a chemical. At a low dose or maybe a somewhat higher dose, you would have uh, adaptive stress responses that would bring the cell back on track. Um, but that at some point, a dose of chemical would 
overwhelm those responses and lead to toxicity. And if we can understand these toxicity pathways here, this figure is from the report as well, in the context of a stronger overall understanding focused on flexibility, risk context, and a more strategic approach, we would have a more protective public health system. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but these slides are, give you some more details on the committee's vision. You can see if you excerpt this out, there's more details on what it views as the, the in, impact of toxicity pathways and targeted testing. Um, and in particular, the committee felt that there needed to be much more emphasis on dose response, on understanding population uh, exposure levels, and being able to link those two. The report has led to a large amount of public and private sector investment in high throughput methods and data interpretation for all kinds of xenobiotics, not only chemicals. One example of this is the EPA's ToxCast program or Toxicity Forecaster, which started in 2010 using hundreds of assays covering thousands of chemicals. And um, you can see different phases that the program is going through. We're currently, they are in phase three of data generation, but the total number of chemicals and number of assays is just uh, very large and very compelling. I would also say the most compelling feature of this work, in fact, is not only the data generation, but this work surrounding it on how to interpret these types of assays, how to share and represent this data, because all of that data is available publicly for use by researchers or companies. Um, and, and EPA has done a lot of work in comparing or trying to figure out how to compare these assay results with existing in vivo data. They have also done quite a bit of work when dose response modeling and in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. And in creating computational models that uh, help to interpret all of the information coming from all of these assays, in especially in concert with potentially higher tier in vitro or in vivo assays. I'd encourage you to take a look and, and take advantage of all of the in vitro and vivo data made available by this program and you can see these uh, websites for that. Well, the future is here. Uh, 3D tissue models of the eye and skin, high throughput and high content assays. Um, like ToxCast are available. There are epithelial models of the airway that are cultured at the air liquid interface. And I can show you um, a larger picture there just so that you can see that, that would, this, these models are very important and uh, fill a uh, high need in the occupational context for showing um, how chemicals uh, expose to sorry, how cells uh, exposed to chemicals in the air react uh, in a biologically relevant manner. And uh, a lot of work has also been done on cheminformatics and databases and predictive modeling. This picture is a virtual embryo, which uh, shows the effects of a thalidomide-like molecule causing disruption of endothelial formation. There is much promise with the use of integrated pluripotent stem cells from groups or from individuals. The idea is you could um, create uh, drug screening or toxicity testing models from an individual skin cells. And these are currently being used for drug screening, but I see a lot of application in uh, the chemicals world. And you might have heard of human organs on chips. These are miniature in vitro cultures perfused with media that are meant to mimic the um, organs in our body. They're created with human cells um, and they're currently available and in various stages of um, readiness for testing. 
are many organs in the body. Um, this work has mostly been uh, catalyzed by the National Center for Advancing Translational Scientists Sciences in uh, NIH and also the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, part of the Department of Defense. So that uh, $70 million project is finished. It's, it was five years old and now NCATS is continuing with funding for three tissue chip testing centers to validate the technology. And I would encourage you uh, when you have some time to check out this link because it's a, it's a very short minute and a half video that goes through and shows the chips and how they work and how the cells are seeded into um, these tiny little uh, silicone or plastic chips and how data is gathered from them. So eventually the thought is that you can link these together to essentially create a human cell based test organism. So this is all very compelling and exciting and currently, however, there is a real mismatch between the scientific advancement and, uh, and in fact, many companies are using some of these technologies now to assess their chemicals internally. But there's a mismatch between that advancement and the regulatory guidelines. And this leads me to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They are um, an international um, intergovernmental test uh, organization that sets international test guidelines. And they have a, a long list of in vivo tests that companies then use to register their chemicals in any member country. So recently, the list of available in vitro test guidelines has grown quite substantially for, and, and, and so in vivo tests for things like skin and eye corrosion, irritation, um, estrogen uh, binding and transactivation, skin sensitization, uh, have um, replaced in vivo tests in large measure. There are also OECD and EPA supported tools uh, to assess chemicals without testing. And one of the stars of this show is the OECD QSAR toolbox. It is a large uh, collection of data and predictive profilers that take the structure of a chemical or the mechanistic activity of pieces of a chemical and can predict or fill data gaps of um, potential toxicity. The QSAR toolbox is nice because it offers workflows for very common endpoints and also provides some metabolism information. Um, However, uh, I would say the uptake of all of these new methods tends to be slow for a number of reasons, including comfort using results of these tools in the context of and in our current in vivo based system. And so in 2010, EPA scientists outlined the adverse outcome pathway concept. And this is caught on like wildfire flout wildfire, excuse me, not only in the ecotoxicology community, but also in the human health toxicology community, because it serves as a bridge between new approaches that I've been talking about and the current testing paradigm. An AOP is simply an organizational framework. It combines information from multiple fields of inquiry and study types and levels of biological organization to illuminate knowledge of biological pathways. And here we're drawing on that earlier discussion of toxicity pathways, but also highlight species differences or similarities, identifies research needs, gosh, excuse me, and supports regulatory decisions. And here in the little green boxes, you can see, um, uh, the results of some different kinds of assays at different levels of biological organization, including the sort of earlier toxicity pathway type, mechanistic type pieces of information, all the way up to the levels 
at the individual and the population that are most often used uh, for regulatory decision making. AOPs can also help to develop new tools because they can provide mechanistic support for existing assays or highlight needs for development of new assays. I think it will also encourage the more frequent use of human data for chemical assessment. Uh, for example, we're currently working on an AOP for the respiratory sensitization or occupational uh, chemical derived allergy and uh, human data is is really important part of this effort um, because the uh, animal data is really uh, lacking I don't want to go too far into the weeds here on on what an AOP looks like but um, the basic elements and I'm going to use the example of skin sensitization so first we know that a chemical interacts with proteins and that's going to be your mo your molecular molecular initiating event there are a series of key events in the middle and for skin sensitization, essentially that covalent interaction causes activation of inflammatory cytokines, um, mobilization of dendritic cells, and then an organ response uh, at the T cell level. And then finally, uh, adverse outcome of inflammation on challenge with an allergen. The key event relationships are very, very important to understand um, because if you can understand the conditions under which one key event leads to the next key event or does not lead to the next key event, you can have confidence in the AOP as a predictive tool. So the OECD, together with the U.S., EPA and other countries have begun an international effort to describe all of the relevant AOPs and record them in this publicly accessible format called the AOP Wiki. Um, and you can see if you visit the AOP Wiki, you can just Google it, what you'll find is a list of hundreds of AOPs in various stages of development and lots of information on how, what we know already about how chemicals cause toxicity. And so this effort uh, to catalog all of these AOPs is bringing toxicological information into a usable, accessible format for all. Since 2012, development of AOPs has really clipped along with uh, more than 150 AOPs now available in this wiki and several going through a process for, for, um, for uh, development and excuse me, for development and endorsement. And those endorsed AOPs are available for publication. Now, um, I'm going to go back to regulatory decision making here. You can link available in silico and in vitro tools to the key events. And so we come back to skin sensitization. There are test guidelines and at other assays available for each of the key events, all the way from in vitro to in vivo. And we now have OECD test guidelines for these assays in addition to the in vivo assays. But how do you make sense of all this information and integrate it into more uh, efficiently to make harmonized regulatory decisions? It sort of becomes information overload at some point. So I promise this is the last a uh, new acronym, but it's, it's an IATA, it's the Integrated Approach to Testing and Assessment. And I just wanted to give you this definition, I'm not going to read it for you, uh, but you can read more at the OECD website. IATA are the opposite of 
check the box lists of toxicology tests. You start out with your problem form formulation and gather all of the existing information, assess it in a stepwise manner and determine, can you make a regulatory conclusion based on your problem formulation? If yes, great. If no, then you want to generate additional information. And the uh, concept is explicitly including not only test guidelines, but also non-guideline methods like ToxCast assays, for example, uh, QSARs, and essentially any piece of evidence that would be useful. You can learn more about these efforts at the OECD website. And then uh, bringing it together with adverse outcome pathways, the AOPs can be used to uh, contribute to an IATA by identifying the relevant information sources linked to those key events for specific endpoints to make your regulatory decision. Importantly, also here is where you would bring in exposure information, absorption distribution, metabolism, exposure information about your specific chemical that you're trying to assess. So for skin sensitization, there is now a published guidance document which outlines 12 different IATAs. And uh, using a variety of different tools, as you can see here. Some of them use adopted in vitro methods. Some of them use only in silico. Some use a, a combination of several sources of information. And uh, the sources you can see are both industrial and government. Uh, Rivum in the Netherlands uh, is the public health agency. The U.S. Uh, National Institutes of Health has a model. The European Commission Joint Research Center has a model. So all of these are available as different options, ways to predict skin sensitization without in vivo tests. So the United States and the European Commission have started an effort to evaluate these strategies against the existing animal data and found that many of them predict human responses better than the local lymph node assay or the guinea pig uh, skin sensitization tests. And you can see first uh, comparisons here of the LLNA and the guinea pig test to human available skin sensitization data. And what you see that it has about, you know, around 80% prediction rate for hazard. The guinea pig is about 72% for hazard. And hazard identification is simply a yes, no. Um, and they also looked at how concordant the local lymph node assay was with itself. And that's about 78% of the time for hazard classification. So when you compare those predictive values to the benchmark of the LLNA, which is our current test, what you find is that many of these strategies, the BASF strategy, the strategy from Cow Corporation, the strategy from ICFAM, Shiseido, all have uh, compare very favorably to the local lymph node assay for um, the prediction of human uh, skin sensitization hazard. Okay, so skin sensitization is one so far success story. Uh, for other endpoints, countries are using a case studies approach to discuss how to use high throughput methods in QSAR methods in another information in an IATA type of approach to make regulatory decisions. And I would really encourage you to take a look at this new body of publications. Each year they take three or four case studies, talk about them, and uh, have sort of a lessons learned uh, document and approach uh, to start to build some international harmonization around how to use new approaches to make, again, regulatory decisions. 
And now uh, to close up, eventually I'd like to turn to the US. We have our own driver that is set to dramatically speed progress in this area. Um, in 2016, the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st century was signed into law. And this law uh, really facilitates the National Academy's vision for 21st century toxicology. And it does this by mandating the reduction and replacement of animal-based tests uh, while incentivizing the development and implementation uh, for of alternative methods and approaches. And this implementation piece is really important. It requires the EPA to not only develop and validate new in vitro tests, but in a way that is focused on the needs that they identify for task assessment of chemicals. Faster, more predictive methods are really integral to the successful implementation of the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for some of the reasons we went over in the beginning of the presentation. EPA needs uh, to prioritize the, the world of existing chemicals, of which there are many thousands, and assess them under tight deadlines. It also needs, um, the law requires EPA to ensure the safety of new chemicals in a more complete way than it has in the past. And uh, there are some new assessment challenges. The law asks EPA to look at mixtures and to look at you know, chemical safety with an eye to sensitive populations and sen workers are included in sensitive populations. So the law puts into place effectively an integrated approach to testing and assessment without explicitly calling it that. So it uh, asks the EPA to use a flexible risk-based approach. There is no single minimum data set. Uh, it re requires EPA to consider exposure as they decide what types of tests they require. Um, it looks, uh, looks for information, characterizes information uh, rather than data as the, the key um, piece of, of information about chemicals, uh, which EPA can use to determine chemical safety or risk. And any scientifically valid method which provides information useful to decision making is relevant. And so what that means is that methods or approaches that industry or companies might use are not limited to validated uh, OECD test guidelines. And finally, um, because the law requires industry to use alternative methods in addition to EPA, EPA is very open to collaboration and wants to hear from companies who can propose new approaches to certify the safety of new chemicals. So with that, I'm going to finish. Uh, I hope I have whetted your appetite to learn more about better ways to assess chemical toxicity and have brought you up to date on some of the dramatic changes that uh, are already taking place. I am especially a, a resource for anyone who wants to learn more and in particular can organize additional, more intensive training or collaboration if desired. Um, you can see my contact email here, of course. Or, um, and so please feel free to contact me. I've uh, put some more resources here. One in particular that I wanted to mention was the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. I um, am the secretary of this organization, but it's a society, um, excuse me, a society dedicated to collaborating and scientific um, advancement around these approaches. And we have our next meeting in Gaithersburg this September. Um, abstract submission is still open until July 10th. And uh, we're going to have a, a long discussion with EPA about uh, TSCA and some of the, the 
activities that they're doing under the Lautenberg Act. So um, it's intended to be a community discussion and uh, collaboration. So I hope you'll consider joining. Um, sorry, it's just, uh, just uh, yes. Um, oh, we'd be happy okay. to take any questions, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you uh, for that presentation, Christy. Um, yeah, we please do enter in questions into the Q&A. Um, for our speaker today. Uh, the first question we have for you is, um, do you think that EPA's regulatory foray into workplace chemical health, which has always been OSHA's purview, will be effective to protecting workers' health since they're largely relying on animal toxicology tests as the basis for their health risk assessments, which as you've described are largely unreliable? I, it, I think it's that's a really tough question. Um, I because we're we're sort of in this middle area where we've identified the problems with animal testing, and we have decided that we need more human relevant approaches. And um, I think what will be really a key to success is how open EPA is to hearing from the regulated community and from the occupational health community that we need you know, more information about how chemicals affect humans and that will lead to better, um, better and more smarter regulation. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, another question we have is about how do chemicals get on the market without safety screening testing, especially if it's required by law? Well, uh, that's a sort of a historical artifact with the first iteration of the Tox Toxic Substances Control Act. So it when it was passed in 1976, it essentially grandfathered in a large number of chemicals who, that were already on the market and that didn't have safety data. And so then new chemicals um, were, dis it was, it, there was a disincentive in place to test new chemicals um, and put new, maybe safer chemicals on the market because uh, it was costly to do tests and so, so the, the, the sort of grandfather chemicals kind of remained on the market. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's a tough one. Yes, and I know you did mention about um, FDA approval for drugs. So I guess there's a sort mm -hmm. of category of chemicals used in industry or manufacturing versus the drugs right. produced for therapeutic reasons. Um, right. um, did you, uh, you mentioned something that the ma market failure rate for new drugs was 96%. Is that from uh, the sort of conception of the testing of a new compound or, or is that once they're actually FDA approved? It's both clinical and market rate. And so essentially what it's saying is that um, drugs that are already in clinical testing, so that's the human clinical studies phase, um, or already on the market, are either those drugs fail in the clinical phase because there's some unexplained toxicity. Some of you might have heard about um, some of the more lethal clinical trials recently, you know, you heard of sort of here in the news, um, some of these tragedies, but also uh, drugs which are on the market and then later have to be withdrawn. So that en encompasses both of those situations. For occupational health professionals, what would you say is the sort of their, their action that they can take in terms of advocacy for this, these kind of changes we've been talking about? Uh, I would say learn more, first of all. Um, I would 
point you to some of the resources that I have already available. Um, learning the promise of some of these uh, approaches and uh, why they should be used can be really, is, is sort of the first step. Um, and then I would say to really talk about this issue, talk about the idea that, you know, we've used these in vivo studies for decades without really questioning whether they're the best approach. And so talking with your colleagues, talking with your, um, uh, in, engaging with companies, engaging with the regulatory agency is really necessary in order to um, show how much interest there is in uh, using the best methods and getting the best data to make decisions. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we still have time. If anyone has any further questions, uh, we can still take another question. Um, but uh, we really appreciate your presentation today. Um, we want to thank you very much and thank everyone who joined us today. Um, again, if anybody would like um, CE credit, please register at our coehce.org website. Um, actually, we do have been this, having these webinars monthly and they take place on the first Wednesday of each month. 10:30 a.m. But we're actually going to be on summer break in August, so our next webinar will be in September with Dr. Robert Harrison presenting on workplace violence. Oh, and I see we have another question, which is, um, how valid do you think non-animal testing will be to assess respiratory sensitization? I'm actually really excited about this area. Um, as I mentioned, we have been working to develop an adverse outcome pathway for this endpoint. And the reason is that, well, there are a number of reasons, but something that might shock people is that there actually isn't a regulatory accepted test for respiratory sensitization. And so we're at a, a good point in time where we can put down our understanding of how this disease works based on all of the information that we currently have about how these chemicals affect biological systems and break it down just as we have with the skin sensitization pathway. In fact, uh, our work is finding that many of the same tests that are currently approved for skin sensitization will be useful for respiratory sensitization, except that they will be slightly different because, um, you know, the immunological uh, endpoint is just sort of slightly different and leading to that respiratory rather than the dermal sensitization endpoint. So I think they'll be very useful. Um, we've already uh, seen that there are a number of similarities between uh, or among mo most of the respiratory sensitizers. We have a good idea of what kind of structure of sensitizers causes respiratory sensitization. Um, some of the tricky tricky part of it is that we still don't quite know the link between, you know, why exactly do those chemicals cause that respiratory effect? And because they don't always cause it in the same people, not everybody gets that effect. And so that's why human information, sort of a human understanding is gonna be really important as well. Um, somebody asked us if the slide presentation will be available for review or download. And yes, um, everybody who, attended today will be emailed with a link to the recording as well as um, a PDF of the slides to review. So um, we st if anybody else has any questions, um, we still have some time we could answer. Um, otherwise, again, I'd like to say thank you very much and um, we really appreciate your 
time today. And again, our next webinar will be on Wednesday, September 6th at 10.30 a.m. And it will be Dr. Robert Harrison presenting on workplace violence. So as at this time, we don't seem to have any more questions. I'd like to say thank you again, and we will be ending the webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.